Hello, living stones. We have no secrets from each other, clearly. Uh, <laughs> it's, they make canning lids. They've, uh, Superb Industries has come out with a better canning lid. And uh, suppose they really are great. I'm not a canner, so I don't know, but the people I've talked to who have used them said they're great. And the song is called, I Can Can, Can't I? Yes, I Can. <laughs> and uh, he said he wanted it catchy and bluegrassy, and he wanted everybody who cans to be singing it while they're using superb lids. And um, I have not heard a single canner sing it, but I can't get it out of my head. It's a, <laughs> So thanks for bringing that up, Mr. Thomas. I really appreciate that. By the way, they are hosting, in, in conjunction with this, a very interesting um, food independence summit for those of you who are backyard gardeners or like to grow your own or prepare your own. Um, it, they have some very interesting speakers. Uh, it's a different approach to all kinds of things. It's, it's in September. It fits into the holy days, and he's actually booked Ricky Skaggs to come, who's a very great bluegrass player. Um, Ricky Skaggs has not indicated any interest in the song, I can can, can't I, I can can. <laughs> but you never know where it will go. Uh, but if you want to look into it, among other things, I have it on my Facebook page, that Food Independence Summit. It's an interesting concept. It doesn't seem like our congregation if Pedro's not here. It really doesn't. So hello, Pedro. And hello, brothers and sisters. Uh, I don't think there's any doubt in anyone's mind that, that we're at some point in the end times. Uh, it's, it's part of the reason that we're all here. It's one of the things that's turned our attention to God. And um, if you'll turn to the book of Malachi, Malachi is a great book to turn to because everyone can find it. It's the last book in the Old Testament, and this is on... Uh, in my Bible, it's the next to the last page of the Old Testament, Malachi 3. And there's a verse that we're all familiar with, Malachi 3, verse 1, where it says, See, I will send my messenger who will prepare the way before me. Then, suddenly, the Lord you are seeking will come to his temple. The messenger of the covenant whom you desire will come. That's what that song we just sang about, sang, was about. It's about the coming of Jesus. But the words I want to focus on is that he will come to his temple. There's got to be a temple for him to come to. Now, there's kind of a dilemma in Matthew 24, if you recall. Matthew 24 is a chapter, again, that focused our attention. In many cases, it's the chapter that got us interested in an end time work where Jesus is talking to his disciples about conditions in the end times. And if you recall, I, and I think you know this without even turning there, it starts out because the disciples come to him and say, isn't this place great? Look at these stones, look at the carving, look at how beautifully things are done. And Jesus says, well, enjoy them while you can because in a few years there won't be one stone on top of another. I think that's called Debbie Downer sometimes on, on TV shows. But they were all excited, and Jesus is, mm -hmm. and um, he, so, the, so the Messiah will come back to a temple, but Jesus said it isn't that one, uh, because all the stones will be cast down. My main interest in life and in, in God's church is, is understanding God and maintaining a friendship with God and helping other people to do the same thing and doing what God wants me to do, and I know you feel the same way. We may think that the temple doesn't have much to do with our day-to-day -day lives, but I want to look at the temple today from God's point of view. And it's a very complex subject, so I kind of have to hit the bare bones. Um, and then we can, after choir practice, while the women are in their study group, we can sit there and argue over uh, refreshments about whether what I say is a bunch of canning lids or not, you know? And um, at the end, I have a picture for you. It's a, I think it's a very interesting picture. It's a very detailed picture, and it shows the temple that Jesus will be returning to, and it shows it in great detail, in so much detail that, that you can make out the individual stones. So stick around. There is no word for temple in the Old Testament. What? Because we read about that, I mean, that's when the temple was built. We have the whole description. But there's no separate word that means temple. 
The word that, that is translated temple, and that's a choice that's made by the translators, is just bait, which means house, or sometimes hekal, which means palace, house or palace, uh, for royalty. You know, um, I think you've seen uh, the word B-E-T-H in, um, connected with synagogues and things like Beth Israel and uh, Bethel, Bethel, and that Beth part just means house, and it's, it's related to the word that gets translated temple. So God, God doesn't talk about a temple in the Old Testament. He talks about a house. And just to get Jesus' own perspective, let's turn to Matthew 12, 6, before we start. And this is just an offhand comment that Jesus makes in the middle of another dilemma, but it just shows his own thinking on it, and that's what I want to talk about today. In Matthew 12 and, and verse 6, he's talking about the temple and what was lawful and what was not lawful because the Pharisees were complaining that they were breaking the Sabbath. And Jesus says, I tell you that one greater than the temple is here. So the temple is important. He supported it. He taught there. But God is greater than the temple. It's just a means to bring us to God and a means to serve God. When the world was created, there was no such thing. There wasn't even a house. There was no need. God didn't have a house. He had a garden. He, and it was, it was a separate place from the rest of the world. It was private. It was a sanctuary for his people. And over time, he had great friendships with people. And these people had no need for a temple. Their relationship existed without such a thing. First, we see him dealing directly with people. He talks to Adam and Eve. He visits them in the garden. He talks to Cain. He talks to Abel. And then as time goes by, we see that it's said in, in Genesis 4 and verse 26, it's said that men began to call on the name of the Lord. And, you know, you can, you can debate what that means. It's, a, it's a, a phrase that has some room in it to talk about what it could possibly mean. But what it means is they had to. God was gone. He'd closed the local office uh, before he used to talk to people directly. But at that point, they had to call him and summon him and, and come to him. Uh, he had friends at, th at that time. He had Enoch. He had Noah. He had Abraham. And these were people who had a relationship with God, who spoke to him personally and yet not in a temple. There was no temple. Later on, even people who you think of as being heavily involved in temple stuff, like Daniel and Ezekiel. Daniel saw the temple when he was a young man, but then it was destroyed, and he was in captivity the rest of his life. This man who had a, a model a relationship with God that we try to pattern our own lives after had no temple at all in his life. Ezekiel, although he talked about a temple, uh, he was born in the time of Josiah. He saw the temple, but he died in uh, either uh, in Babylon or in Babylonia, anyway, in some part of it. So he, he, he received messages about the temple, but the temple wasn't part of his life. Um, the nation of Israel arose when there was no temple. Moses arose when there was no temple. They left Egypt. They received the Ten Commandments, and they made a covenant with God, and there was no tabernacle and no mention of one up to that point. But then, let's turn to Exodus 25. And this is a new beginning. God has an idea here. This is the beginning of God establishing his tabernacle. But let's look at why. If he tells them things that they need to donate to prepare his um, his house, but um, this is the first we hear about it. He hasn't talked about it before. And in verse 8, he gives us his thinking at that point. He says, then have them make a sanctuary for me, and I will dwell among them. And that is the theme of the temple. Make this tabernacle and all its furnishings exactly like the pattern I will show you. And as you know, he gives very, very detailed instructions, so much that people can build replicas of it today, and it, at least proportionally and, and in other ways, uh, it's very much like what they would have had back then. And I'm sorry, I have to skip over a great deal, but you know a great deal about the tabernacle and about the temple. So let's just go to... Um, to Exodus, well, no, before we do, I want to point out that God has a temple in heaven. In Micah, Micah's a little harder to find, but once you get there, we're in the first chapter. 
Micah. It's harder for me to find. Extra points if you're singing the books of the Bible song in your head right now <laughs> to find Micah. Micah chapter 1 and verse 2. Hear, O peoples, all of you, listen, O earth, and all who are in it, that the sovereign Lord may witness against you the Lord from his holy temple. This doesn't seem to be the one on earth. It seems to be something else. In Habakkuk, a few books later, and if you want to just let me read it, I will. In Habakkuk 2 and verse 20, it says, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Let all the earth be silent before him. But, but even more clearly, in, in the book of Revelation and chapter 11, Revelation 11 and verse 19, and again, this is in, in the middle of a, a whole huge story, but in verse 19, it says, Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen the ark of his covenant, and there came flashes of lightnings, rumblings, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a great hailstorm. So God has a temple in heaven? What's up with that? We know that Jesus Christ had to come you know, and present his own sacrifice to his Father. But a temple? What does God need a temple? I mean, Jesus is the one who said, we're greater than the temple. Why would God even have one? And I, I wonder, and it's just a wonder, but you know me, I just can't stop wondering, is that God's presence was in the temple, in the tabernacle and later in the temple. As a matter of fact, let's turn to Exodus 40, where the story of the building of the tabernacle comes to its pinnacle because the tabernacle is done and it's open for business. And in Exodus 40, starting in verse 33, then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. And of course it means Moses and his staff. I mean, he had a lot of people helping him. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting. So something happened at that point. It was all done, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. So it worked. They followed the instructions to a T, and it worked. But what I propose to you you know, God lives in a different world. We used to sometimes say, well, God lives in the north, but the James Webb Telescope is not going to find God. The senses that we have do not detect God. God exists in his own world, and our world, if anything, is the imaginary one. Our world is the, the setup, the trial, the laboratory. God lives in reality in his own world, and apparently, there's a temple there. So God has a temple in his world, and he's had them build a tabernacle in this world. Now, God, you know, has trouble coming into our world. It says when Jesus returns, the heavens will open. I mean, cell phone coverage will go out at that point. He'll interfere with all kinds of things. But it's it, one of the reasons that God doesn't appear in our world is that it would be bad for our world for him to do it. Uh, it's always an uproar when he does. And when, when he does appear, I, I, I've talked to some of you before about the fact that it, it's often manifested with smoke and with fire, and that's what happens here. So suppose... The temple in God's world is a portal to this, and it's his connection. And in real time, he's there, and yet he's appearing here. And it's, it's a connected enough that he can, his presence can fill it, and that he can appear as fire and as smoke. And, and this presence, the presence of the Lord is, is a very important concept when you talk about the tabernacle and the temple. But it, the presence of the Lord is not always there. They could tell when it was there and they could tell when it was not. And I think that the, the tabernacle in heaven and the, the tabernacle on earth, the temple in heaven and the tabernacle and later the temple were linked and it was God's way of connecting with people. It was a place to connect with his people, with his called out ones, his nation, in person. And if you recall in Exodus 25, that's what he wanted to do. He wanted to be with them. It was a two-way street because people brought their offerings and they sacrificed. They worshipped him. They were directly connected to God at that point. They worshipped him. There was teaching. 
God communicated with them. God gave directions. There was a high priest. And we know that this high priest, even in the details of his clothing, was meant to be a stand-in for Jesus Christ. People were supposed to look at the high priest and realize that it was really Jesus Christ and, and that the high priest, which changed with the death and, and uh, new high priest, I mean, it would change with the generations, but he always represented Jesus Christ, a, a clean person who dressed in white and presented sacrifices to God for them. They received direction and they received inspiration. Well, when we look at the history of the tabernacle and the temple, I have to condense the story quite a bit. And my, uh, my ace in the hole is that you people know a lot about the story. You know about the tabernacle and you know about the temple. They're some of the most dramatic stories in the Bible. And so you know a lot of the history. But of course, the tent of meeting was with them for the entire time that they wandered in the desert for 40 years. And then when they came to the promised land, to the land that they received from God, after some deliberations and other things going on, the tent of meeting was set up in a town called Shiloh. And the reasons are complicated, and it's sort of interesting to read because it had to do with, with disputes between the different tribes. You know, would it be here, would it be here, would it be here? And they set it up in Shiloh to kind of please everybody. Um, and, and Shiloh was very well known. And then later on, the first mention of the temple the first mention of the temple of the house for God is in a place that you might not expect. Turn to 1 Samuel and chapter 1. And it says that year after year, in 1 and verse 3, this man went up, this is Samuel's father, went up to town to worship and to sacrifice to the Lord Almighty at Shiloh. And it talked about uh, what he did. And then in, in down in verse 7, it says, when Hannah went up to the house for the Lord. And then in other places in this story, you know the story of the boy Samuel. Who, that's not the point of this at this point. But the point is that in all this with the priest Eli and his sons and Samuel in the whole story, suddenly this place is referred to as a house. Now, there was a word for the tabernacle and for the tent of meetings, meeting, so this is significant. And yes, we know that the tent of meeting was there, so it could have been the tent of meeting, but it seems like there might have been a building built there. When you read about descriptions like the priest sitting by the doorpost or the rooms that Samuel went into, it didn't seem to match the tabernacle. Um, and you, you think, well, that was just a temporary thing, but between the time when the tabernacle was set up in Shiloh and when it was destroyed, or I'm sorry, when the, when the Philistines captured the ark, around this time, between that time, you think, well, short time, it was 369 years. So God had been worshipped in that place more than three centuries, almost four centuries. And in that time, it seems that maybe they built a bricks and mortar, well, wood and cloth building at that point for a little more sturdiness. There was still a tent of meeting because we hear about it. But um, in Shiloh, it seems that there was a building. Now the ark was there. And later on, you know the story, we've talked about it in, um, oh, what is it? In, in 1 Samuel chapter four, the Philistines captured the ark. And this, this leads to the, the very famous story that I once talked about, about the golden hemorrhoids. And that's exactly what they are. You can read the story yourself. I'm not making it up. There really is a story about golden hemorrhoids in the Bible. Um, but Shiloh was destroyed at this point when the Philistines captured the ark and when Eli died. And it doesn't mean much to us today, but it meant quite a bit to ancient Israel and even to, even, uh, to, to Jews and Israelites of a much later time. And one of the reasons we know this is that in Jeremiah, Jeremiah chapter 7 and verse 12 and the follow. well, let's turn there. Jeremiah 7 and verse 12. He's looking back, and of course, this is another few hundred years later. Jeremiah 7 and verse 12, Shiloh never recovered. And it was, it was used as a bad example and an example of destruction. 
Jeremiah 7, verse 12, go now to the place in Shiloh where I first made a dwelling for my name. And that's an interesting phrase because in Shiloh, that's where the name Sabaoth, the Lord of hosts, was first used. Not the Yahweh that we came to know from Moses, but the Lord of hosts. And it specifically mentions that Samuel's father went up to visit, to worship the Lord of hosts and to sacrifice. And God put his name there. And then it says, and see what I did to it because of the wickedness of my people Israel. He destroyed it. He wiped it out. And he threatens in verse 14, he says, therefore, what I did to Shiloh, I will now do to the house that bears my name, which of course was Solomon's temple at that point. And there actually is another long account of this, and it's from King David's time, the time almost to the building of the temple, and it's back in Psalm 78. And it was written by Asaph, so we can date it pretty well, because Asaph was one of the people appointed by um, David to write jingles for the temple. I'm sorry, to write songs for the temple. And... Um, he delivered, but some of his are very hard to understand. But in, at the end of Psalm 78, he talks about um, this story. And it's a story of destruction. Let's start in verse 60. He abandoned, and this is talking about God, he abandoned the tabernacle of Shiloh, the tent that he had set up among men, and he sent the ark of his might into captivity. And then all the way to the rest of the end of that psalm, he's talking about the destruction of Shiloh. So we don't think about it much, but it was very much part of people's history. Part of, you know, like in Texas, you know the Alamo. In, in ancient Israel, you knew Shiloh. You knew that it had been destroyed. And one of the reasons that it's very important is at this point, the tent of meeting and the ark went their separate ways until the temple was built. And uh, the, 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 uh, the tent got around after that. The ark went to a town called Kiriath Jearim. <laughs> Uh, we know that. It went there after the Golden Hemorrhoids incident, and um, it was stayed there until uh, David brought it to Jerusalem. But the tabernacle itself, the tent of meeting, moved on to a town called Nob, and then to Gibeon. And when David moved the ark to Jerusalem, he left the tent in Gibeon. And people still, still did the sacrifices, and they still did the altar there. And then when Solomon rebuilt the temple, of course, with God's approval, in 1 Kings 8 and verse 4, we read that he brought the tent of meeting to Jerusalem at that point, and everything that was in it, which includes the altar. Um, although Solomon built a new altar, it, it had the old worship methods brought to Jerusalem. Now, why is that important? Why is all that detail important? I'm sure, you know, you're on the verge of sleep at this point. Well, it shows that God wasn't as concerned with the tent and the ark as you might think he was, that he let all kinds of things happen to it. And then it was finally restored, and there were rules to be obeyed, because you remember when David brought the ark to Jerusalem, people died because they didn't treat the ark correctly. So God was involved, and God was interested, but the rules weren't followed very well up till that point. Well, then you know that the temple was built by Solomon, covered with gold and cedar wood. It was glorious. We have no, you know, nothing uh, to, to look at about it. It was rebuilt later by Josiah, which Alan Waterhouse mentioned a few weeks ago, and that's quite a story, too, that it fell into disrepair. So again, the people weren't that, um, that interested in the temple. We think that it dominated their life, but they let it fall into disrepair and they didn't even know how to worship in it at that point. They had gone on to, to, to other ways of worshiping. It was this temple that was rebuilt was destroyed by the Babylonians, as you know, in 587 BC. The temple was rebuilt by Zerubbabel and Joshua, but then it was plundered and desecrated by a man named Antiochus Epiphanes in 169 BC. And after that, that's when the, the Maccabees rose up and rededicated it. And, you know, the oil burned and we have the Feast of Lights, Hanukkah these days. And then in 19 BC, King Herod decided that he would rebuild. He had permission from the Romans government and he rebuilt the temple and apparently it was restored to much of its former glory. And that's the temple that existed when Jesus was alive. Uh, I, it was being constantly worked on. We don't have it today, but that was Herod's temple from 19 BC. Still, although the temple was very important, there are hints 
throughout the Old Testament that it wasn't the greatest thing on God's mind. And if you turn to 2 Chronicles 6.18, this is the dedication of the temple. And it's uh, Solomon himself speaking. And this is echoed in 1 Kings word for word. But in 2 Chronicles 6 and verse 18, Solomon says in a prayer to God in the temple, talking to God himself, whose presence came into the temple, he says, but will God really dwell on earth with men? The heavens, even the highest heavens, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. That's pretty amazing. They have spent the resources of the nation on building a temple, and Solomon said, but, you know, it can't hold you. So it was important, but there were hints that, that it was not a permanent thing. In Isaiah chapter 66 and verse 1, Isaiah is talking about the world tomorrow and how Israel will be restored. And yet, this is what the Lord says, and it's a message to Isaiah in Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things so that they came into being, declares the Lord. And he says, this is, this is one I esteem. He says, I'm not necessarily interested in that. I'm interested in he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. And then he talks about how people who sacrifice a bull are like people who commit murder. What? You know, there was an important reason to do sacrifices, and God was the one who had set up the directions for the sacrifices. But he said things had turned at that point, and things were going to happen, and he can't be contained by a temple. Well, we know that Jesus, when he was born, lived in the world of the temple at Jerusalem. Uh, there were direct places in his life. We know that he was taken there as an infant. He was presented in a purification rite. That's where he met Anna uh, and um, uh, the other man, you know, him. I guess I have to look it up. Can someone help me who the man was? Okay, I'll do it myself. Uh, Anna and Simeon, thank you. Um, easy name, where, where he met these people and they were part of the temple service at that point. Anna was a prophetess and said she basically lived there and she prayed night and day. So Jesus' uh, parents went to the temple. When you got in trouble, where did you go? To you know the woods, to places where you shouldn't have been. When Jesus got in trouble, he went to the temple and asked questions. You know that story. He was 12 years old. His parents couldn't find him. And uh, he was in the temple asking questions, learning about himself, I bet. I bet he had a lot of questions. And you know, we think, well, he's asking hard questions to the, to the priests. But I think he was asking questions about himself, trying to understand himself. He was a 12-year-old boy growing up, and I think that's why he was bent. Something drew him there to where the presence of his father was, and he asked questions like that. He taught in the temple. He healed in the temple. He went into the temple and turned over tables and said, zeal for the Lord's house has consumed me. So he was very temple positive. He loved it. He paid the temple tax. Uh, sometimes when he healed people, he would say, now you be sure to go and do the purification things at the temple. You be sure to fulfill that. And um, in Matthew 8 and, and verse 4, he uh, specifically tells a leper about that. Until he died, he respected the temple. But again, in his work, he dropped some very clear hints. You remember he said there is one greater than the temple. And then in John 2 and verse 19, says something very important, and this is a significant passage because what he says here is not recorded in the other three Gospels, but it's quoted in the other three Gospels. What happened after he said it is reported in the other three Gospels, but this is where it came out of his mouth. In John 2 and verse 19, Jesus said, destroy this temple and I will raise it again in three days. Well, the moment he said that, there was an uproar. And people remembered it. People definitely heard it. It wasn't something that he whispered on the side. People heard it, and three and a half years later, they quoted it back to him. They quoted it as a taunt when he was dying. They quoted it when he was, when he was being convicted at his trial, 
And they quoted it again after he had risen and said, he did tell us, you know. He did tell us, but people misunderstood. And that's the human folly, is that we look at the literal. When Jesus at that time was clearly, clearly speaking of something else. And if you recall, when he died in Matthew 27 and verse 51 and other places, it mentions that the veil into the Holy of Holies was torn in two. And we had direct contact at that point. Human beings have had direct contact with God the Father. But after that, Jesus never set foot in the temple again. He was resurrected. He was on earth for 40 days. But it appeared that he had lost interest in the temple. He wasn't interested in it at all. He had other things to do, like maybe enjoy this beautiful earth before he went back to his father until he uh, returned thousands of years later. But he did not go to the temple. And after he died, God still honored the temple as long as his people were there, and they were there. It says after the crucifixion that they didn't know what to do, so they went to the temple. His disciples gathered there. It was a safe place for them. In Acts, uh, let's turn to Acts 2 and verse 46. This is on that uh, first day of Pentecost after Peter has given his sermon. It doesn't say exactly where they were when the tongues of fire came down. But in Acts 2 and verse 36, it says, therefore, well, wait a minute. Where do I want to be? 2.46. Okay. 46, every day they continued to meet in the temple courts. Now that wasn't where the services were held, but that was where God's people got together and fellowshiped and talked and how's your kids and how's your grandkids. And they broke bread in their homes and ate together, but they also met in the temple at that point. And you know, in, in chapter three, you know the story of Peter and John healing the, the crippled beggar in the temple courts. And... Um, in Acts 5 and verse 42, it says, Day after day in the temple courts and from house to house, they never stopped teaching and proclaiming the good news that Jesus is the Christ. So he was still taught in the temple. But you know what happened. It appeared that God himself had lost interest in the temple, and it was a mere matter of decades later when it was totally destroyed and never rebuilt. And now there's a mosque built on that site. So the, as long as God's people were there, God seemed to protect it. But then things changed slowly. And we, we first get a breath of that in Acts 7, where Stephen, who was as converted, uh, he was one of the Hellenists, so he wasn't as oriented towards the temple as other people. But in Acts 7, he says something very important, and it was part of what got him killed. In Acts 7 and verse 48, he quotes Isaiah and says, however, the Most High does not live in houses made by men. This is not a politically correct thing to say while you're standing in Jerusalem and people are angry at you who very much support the temple. And as you know, uh, it was one of the things that led to his death um, before, the, before the speech is even over. Then Paul came upon the scene. And the gospel went out to the Gentiles and was preached to the whole world. And soon you could see that a temple for one nation was not only impractical, but it just didn't make much sense anymore. In Acts 17 and verse 24, Paul says, the God, he's talking to the Athenians, and the, the Athenians are as Gentile as you can get. They're the ones who had the temple to the unknown God, and Paul is using this to present the gospel of Jesus Christ at that point. And he says in verse 24, standing in Athens, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by hands. And this is a man who learned at the feet of Gamaliel who taught in the temple. And yet Paul is very adamant about it, so something has changed. It's worth mentioning later on that Paul goes to the temple to be purified in Acts 21. It wasn't his idea, and can I say this about things in the Bible? You can argue with me later. I don't think it was a very good idea. I think it was a mistake because it led to his being arrested. God used it in very interesting ways to, again, further the gospel. And possibly it was preached even more widely because of Paul's arrest than, than if he had never been arrested. But he was in the temple being purified for seven days. And the reason was he wanted to show that he was not against the Jewish way of life, that he wasn't saying destroy it, but that he was opening up God's gospel to the Gentiles. Uh, it didn't work out, and it did work out. Um, God used it, definitely.
Remember the purpose from God's point of view for a temple or a tabernacle was to make a connection with his people, his community, his nation. He does this with a spirit in individuals, as Paul says in 1 Corinthians 3 and verse 16. And again, these are verses that aren't secret to you. You know them very well. 1 Corinthians 3, 16. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple and that God's spirit lives in you? And then he elaborates on that. But now, God's people are the temple and his spirit lives in us. So individuals are the temple. And he repeats that in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. And then in the book of Ephesians and chapter 2, in Ephesians 2, verses 21 and 22, he says, he talks about the entire church being a version of God's temple. He says, in him, the whole building is joined together and rises to become a holy temple in the Lord. And the reason is, and in him, you too are being built together to become a dwelling in which God lives by his spirit. So this is the dwelling. We're beginning to see it. This is what God is interested in these days, dwelling in people. His temple from that point on is a spiritual matter. In Revelation, and Se Revelation 7 and verse 15, where we've already gone and it talks about, no, we haven't gone there. Revelation 7 and verse 15, and uh, you know, Revelation, there's a lot of allegory in it. And it says, therefore, they are before the throne, talking about righteous people who've come out of the great tribulation and washed their robes. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And we know that we want to be pillars in God's temple, and yet there's no temple at this point. So there are many references to God's temple from Revelation 17 on up to chapter 21, but they're all talking about the temple in heaven at that point. After that, uh, in Revelation and 11 and verse 19, where it says, and this is where we've been before, then God's temple in heaven was opened, and it talks about all the events and all the noise. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of Jesus Christ coming back. And the temple is opening, and he's establishing a connection with earth at this point. And soon, the heavens themselves will open up. But that's the beginning, is that God opens the temple in heaven. The work of the physical temple by now has been fulfilled, and the real high priest has gone on to the real holy of holies. And this is very clearly laid out in the book of Hebrews chapter 4. And let's turn to Hebrews chapter 8, because this sums it up in words that are very difficult to argue with. Hebrews chapter 8 and verse 5, Paul says, they serve at a sanctuary... Well, let's go to, to um, verse 3. Every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it was necessary for this one to have something to offer. If he were on earth, these are the old days, he would not be a priest, for there are already men who offer the gifts prescribed by the law. Then in verse 5, they serve at a sanctuary that is a copy and a shadow of what is in heaven. So no matter how great the tabernacle was, no matter how gold, how beautiful the wood was, how beautiful the stones were carved, it was always a copy and a shadow in God's mind. Of what? Well, back to Malachi 3 and verse 1, and you know it enough to know that it talks about where the Lord is coming suddenly to his temple. What temple is he coming to? Of course, people would think, people in Jesus' day who read Malachi, which was written not that long before, would think that it was a reference to the temple. But just as Jesus' own references to destroying the temple and rebuilding it in three days were misunderstood by literalists, I feel that Malachi 3.1 is misunderstood by literalists. There is no need for a physical temple, but there will be one. Now, that's one of the odd things. The only references to the physical temple that will exist in the end times, people will make the effort and rebuild the temple. The only references to it are that there will be, in 2 Thessalonians, Paul mentions a man of lawlessness who will appear at the temple. And in Matthew 24 and verse 14, he talks about, you better watch for an abomination of desolation in the holy place. Aren't those strange things to assign to the physical temple? That's all we have. Because our connection is with the real house. 
the world will be focused on the rebuilding of that temple, and boy, won't it make a mess. I mean, the people who built that mosque on the site are going to be upset. Uh, it will happen, but it will distract from God's efforts. Yeah, I mean, it'll, uh, what's the right word? It'll be a decoy to take some of the stress off God's efforts to build the real house. And at this point, I have to say a word, and it'll be a quick word, about the book of Ezekiel in chapters 40 to 48. Because it talks about, very detailed, it talks about a temple being built. And it talks about um, how the different forms of service will be reestablished. But you have to take it as a whole. That's one vision, and it goes from chapter 40 through the very end of Ezekiel in chapter 48. Let's turn to Ezekiel 47. You can't separate bits of it out. It's all of one piece, this particular uh, prophecy. And frankly, I don't know what it means, and I've never heard people in our church come up with a totally coherent explanation of what these scriptures mean. I, I accept them, and what I accept is that when it happens, I will understand it, and I will understand why God is doing it. But this whole story, if we, if we look in chapter 47 of Ezekiel, it talks about the river. And it talks about the water rising up and coming down from the temple. And then uh, he measures it in verse 3, and it gets deeper and deeper and deeper. And finally, in verse 5, no one can walk across it. You have to swim. And then in verse 7, it talks about a number of trees on each side of the river. And then it talks about swarms of living creatures will live where the river flows, and there will be large numbers of fish, and fishermen will stand there. And then in verse 12, fruit trees of all kinds will grow on both banks of the river. The trees will not wither, nor will the fruit fail. Every month they will bear because the water from the sanctuary flows to them. Their fruit will serve for food and their leaves from healing. And you know enough about the Bible to know what that's talking about and what that's connected with. It's even after the millennium when, when God himself comes and dwells with men. That's when those conditions exist. And at the end, at the end of all this temple stuff, there's a beautiful, beautiful verse that Ezekiel's prophecy ends with. If you turn to the last verse of Ezekiel, it's just a chapter away, or a page away. And the last part of uh, Ezekiel, what is it? Ezekiel 48 and verse 35, it says, And the name of the city from that time on will be, The Lord is there. And that's the whole theme of it. That's how God thinks of the temple. It's his connection. He's there. We're there. So what do we know about this house that will be ready when Jesus returns? Well, you can give whole Feast of Tabernacles worth of sermons on that. And, and thankfully, we're about to hear them, and they'll be wonderful. The book of Haggai talks about the restoration by a, a, a new Zerubbabel and a new Joshua who will be building the house of the Lord. And that's firmly tied into the future, and it will be a spiritual temple. And people will be saying, not time for the house to be built. And that's kind of what we're doing today. We can't even agree enough to be one organization. We can't be one house. We're many splits at this point. But in those days, it will be built. They will be building the spiritual house. And uh, they're talked again, talked about again in Revelation 11. And many of you have read that over and over because you want to know who the two witnesses are and what they're doing. Well, I'll tell you what they're not doing. They're not building a physical temple. It doesn't mention that at all. They're ministering to the entire earth and they're preaching God's way, but they're not building a bricks and mortars temple building. How I wish I could go into this because this is where my heart is. This is what I look forward to God doing in the near future. God will be building a community of love and of law and of gardening and of rebuilding old buildings. And, in, and children will be there and families and there will be singing. Uh, this is summed up in Ch Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 30, and we've talked about this before, and this takes place before Jesus Christ returns. It talks about that kind of community, and um, in Jeremiah verse 30, there's two things I want to, want to point out. In verse 18, it says, the city will be rebuilt on her ruins, and the palace will stand in its proper place. And the palace is one of the words that is used to describe the temple. So it will be established at that point, and this, is, this jives, this meshes with the place of safety prophecies, that God will be building a community at that point. 
And it's summed up in verse 22. And again, it's the same theme. You're seeing some continuity here. So you will be my people and I will be your God. Well, you know the end time story, but we're about to go over it all, starting with the Feast of Trumpets and the Day of Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles in the last day and everything that happens in history after that. We have to skip over that to Revelation 21 and verse 22. Revelation 21 and verse 22, it says, uh, John received a vision of the city and he said, I did not see a temple in the city because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. So even the heavenly temple will be irrelevant at that point. And this is Yes, it's a, a pinnacle and a peak, but it's only the beginning, and we don't know where history will go after that, but we know that it'll be beautiful and wonderful and an extension of God's righteousness. And this was always the plan. From the day God said, build me a tent of meeting, the plan was, but it'll be gone someday. Although the temple is gone, the house of God lives on. As in the beginning, so it will be in the end, where God was a gardener and a grower of people. He had a garden, a river, a people, there was a God, and there was a great family. It will grow forever, and of its great story, there will be no end. Now, I promised you a picture, and, and I will give you a picture. I won't be able to show it to you till after um, services at this point. But it's a picture of the temple of God, and it, as I said, you can see even the individual bricks in it. Say cheese. Cheese. 